I'm Elizabeth at A Literary Princess, and today I am doing my September wrap-up. So I read 10 full books this month, but I also read two partial books, so I am going to start with them. First up, we have The Journals and Letters of Francis Burney. Finally, this is like the third month I had this on a TBR, and I finally read it. I only read about 200 pages of this, just the parts that were pertaining to the publication of her four novels. And I want to go back and read the whole thing. I was really enjoying this. Yeah. Also, but the print is tiny. Like, I had a very hard time looking at it. It's such small print. But yeah, it was really good. I'm not reading it because I didn't give, I didn't read the whole thing, but I definitely want to go back and revisit it. All right, next up is one with no cover. Um, this is Margaret Oliphant, Critical Essays on a Gentle Subversive, edited by DJ Trela. I read this um, for my Victorian popular women's fiction uh, list, and the, specifically the nonfiction section of that list. I have read some of these essays before, but I wanted to read a few others of them. And again, I read, I read, honestly, probably most of it. I think there were maybe three or four essays I didn't read. But again, I'm not reading it, but I really enjoyed it. And it's going to be useful for me. Okay, now on to the ones I actually read in full. First up, we have one that I read as an ebook. This is Silent Voices, Forgotten Novels by Victorian Women Writers. It is a collection edited by Brenda Ayers. I was originally only going to read some of these essays and have it be another one that I only read partial, but um, then I just decided to read all of them. And I'm really glad that I did. I enjoyed these essays quite a lot, uh, dealing with all kinds of different things, sensation novels, governess novels. I'm trying to remember what else. I read this at the beginning of the month, so it was kind of a while ago now. <laughs> um, oh, there was one on Anne Thackeray who we will get to in a minute. Um, and then, yeah, just a bunch of other great women writers, some of whom I didn't really know very well, and that then got added onto my list because clearly that needed to happen. <laughs> but, you know, so I gave this four stars and I find, I'm find i gonna find it very helpful. Next up was Story of an African Farm by Olive Schreiner. This was for my Victorian popular women's fiction list. Olive Schreiner is one of the early new women novelists. She um, grew up actually in South Africa, which is where this book is set. I had very mixed feelings about this book. On one hand, I really enjoyed the character of Lyndall, who is our new woman character. But um, on the other hand, I thought she was going to be more of the main focus, but a lot of it was actually focused around, oh, what was his name? Was it Hugo? It's this boy that works on the farm and he's, a, he's an odd one. He's really odd. And I'm like looking for his name because I'm, <laughs> I think it's, oh, Waldo. It's, I was close. Waldo. Um, and yeah, a lot of focus is on him and he is very much like in his own head. And it's just kind of very strange, which is actually pretty um, in league with what women novelists of this kind of genre were doing. They did a lot of experimental structural things. And I would say this counts, but I, I don't know. It was just weird. <laughs> it was really weird. It starts with um, Waldo, Lindell, and Lindell's cousin, um, M, um, as children on the farm, and then they, they grow, it follows them as they grow up, um, and M's stepmother is the one who owns the farm now, and she lets in this guy named Bonaparte, who is not good, and who is kind of a, is like a very abusive towards the children particularly Waldo and it, I don't know it was just weird I gave this three stars because I did really like the stuff toward the end with Lindell but the early stuff with Waldo I was just like what is happening what is this and it didn't quite feel cohesive to me 
So I wasn't a huge fan, but it wasn't bad. All right, next up was for my feminist theory list. This is Surpassing the Love of Men, Romantic Friendship and Love Between Women from the Renaissance to the Present by Lillian Faderman. So as the title says, this is focusing on... So Surpassing the Love of Men. As the title says, it is focusing on romantic love and or romantic friendship and love between women. And I thought this was fascinating. So we start in the Renaissance and we look at different literature throughout and going into the 20th century. The parts, of course, that were most interesting to me were the 18th and 19th centuries and a bit of the early, tw early 20th century. But I got all kinds of reading recommendations from this. Again, I don't need any more reading recommendations, but I got them and I really enjoyed this. I gave it four stars. Next up was another one for my feminist theory list and it also doesn't have a cover because it's a library book. This is How to Suppress Women's Writing by Joanna Russ. And this ended up being my favorite book of the month. I gave this four and a half stars, very slim little volume. And it's all about the different methods that have been used over the years to suppress women's writing. And the idea is basically like, she didn't write it, but even if she did, she shouldn't have. But even if she should have, the content's problematic. Or even if she should have, it, she didn't know what she was doing. And even if she did know what she was doing, and on and on and on. And this was just fascinating. It was so useful to me. I was just, I was in love with this. The reason that it's only four and a half stars and not five is that Joanna Russ was hating on my girl Weta, who is a 19th century novelist who, she she was like, oh, Weta's books aren't good. I'm like, oh, Given I've only read one of Weta's books, but it was really good. So I disagreed on that and that that brought it down to four and a half. But ultimately this was fantastic. It's going to be so useful to me in my dissertation and in my exams. Next up was for my long 19th century list. This is Barchester Towers by Anthony Trollope. This was my first Trollope book and it is, I believe, the second one in the Barsetshire Chronicles or the Chronicles of Barsetshire and honestly I should have read the first book first <laughs> because that would have helped a lot and I have the first book but the first book's not on my list because my advisor for this list was like oh Barchester Towers is one of his best known ones like okay yeah but it introduces all these characters in the warden and now I don't know who people are but I do think Trollope did a good enough job giving you an idea if you hadn't read the first one. There were just some things that I think would have been better if I had read the first one. I had mixed feelings about this. I mostly really liked it, but there were some parts where I was just like, okay, come on. This is about this town Barchester and the bishop has died and there's a newly appointed bishop and it results in a power struggle between several different people, including the archdeacon, um, the former warden of the hospital who had stepped down in the previous book. This is where it would have been helpful if you have read the first book. And then some several other characters. And of course, their wives and their daughters are all coming into it. And it's it's just about this power struggle in a in a town, basically. And I thought it was quite good. Trollope is very funny. I really enjoyed the parts with, I believe her name is Eleanor, who is the daughter of the former warden. And she was fantastic. I loved the plot with her. She had multiple guys trying to get with her, but she didn't realize they were trying to get with her. And then the whole town was basically talking about how she was gonna marry this one guy who everyone hates. And she had no idea and people are confronting her about it. And once she finally figures it out, she's so offended. <laughs> So I love that part. Some of the parts where the where the men <laughs> were talking and like dealing with their small political things, I was just like, okay, I don't care. 
<laughs> I said this in my currently reading about it, but overall I did really enjoy it. I gave it three and a half stars. So it's not four because of those parts that just kind of dragged for me. But there are hilarious characters in here and Eleanor's amazing. Although, oh my God, I wanted to punch the Archdeacon several times. I was like, sir, you are the worst. I hate you. But yeah. <laughs> All right, next up I read was one on audiobook that I'm finally done with. How many currently readings was this on? I'm not sure, but it was a lot. This is The Beast's Heart by Leif Shalcross. So this is a retelling of Beauty and the Beast set from the Beast's perspective. And it's lovely. Like it is a beautiful retelling, very quiet, very character focused, not a lot of action, just character development, relationship development, description. It, it was beautiful. I really enjoyed this. I read it on audiobook and the narrator Jim Dale did a really good job. And I just, yeah, I really enjoyed it. It took me forever to read because I wasn't in an audiobook mood and then I had to return it twice, I think. Yeah, <laughs> but I finally finished it and I really did enjoy it. I am going to do a fairy tale Friday on it, so I don't want to say too much about it here. And then next up was one that I read on my Kindle. And this is where we talk about Anne Thackeray again. This is the story of Elizabeth by Anne Thackeray Ritchie. Anne Thackeray Ritchie is the daughter of William Makepeace Thackeray, so who wrote Vanity Fair. And the story of Elizabeth is her first novel. And it's the story of this young woman named Elizabeth who is living with her mother in France, I believe in Paris. And she is in love with this Englishman named Sir John. And she's hoping that he will come and basically whisk her away because her mother has remarried and she's very unhappy um, living with her step family who are very religious. And she's kind of more of a worldly girl. And she gets herself into some trouble and things happen. It's a, there's some scandal and they're trying to suppress the scandal and there's there's Ill, dramatic illness like there is in every Victorian book. I ultimately gave this three stars. I didn't find it super compelling. Like it felt very standard. I wish there'd been a little more character development, but I did like that Elizabeth wasn't this perfect person, which you see a lot in 19th century literature, more so toward the beginning of the century. But I mean, even still, like in a lot of Dickens novels, like you either have the perfect woman or the fallen woman, and that's kind of it. So I like that Elizabeth ha is like not real, like she's kind of a brat. She's a major brat throughout <laughs> until toward the end. And I, I appreciated that, that we were seeing that. And I also appreciated that um, the author came right out and said at the beginning, like, her troubles weren't very big, but they felt very big to her. And like acknowledging that, like, this is a tiny little thing and it doesn't really matter, but it does matter because it's like part of the human experience. I don't know. It was interesting. I gave it three stars. I do want to read more by Anne Thackeray Ritchie, especially because she wrote um, some fairy tales. So I would love to look at those. Next up was for my feminist theory list, and this was Sexual Politics by Kate Millay. And this was my least favorite book of the month. I gave this two stars. This took me forever to read because I just did not want to read it. And now I don't have any problem with Millay's argument. She's completely correct. Um, basically that to read that cultural discourse reflects a systematized subjugation and exploitation of women. And that attitude is just all through literature, philosophy, psychology, and you can see it. And so, I mean, she starts out with some very uh, explicit, let's call it, sections of some novels. And I was just kind of like, oh. And like, I absolutely agree with her that this is all through our culture. It's in our literature. It's in our television. It's in our movies. It's everywhere. It is everywhere. Women being degraded by men who then feel like they're all important and whatnot. 
but it doesn't mean I enjoyed reading about it. I did appreciate that she shit on Freud a lot. Always love that. But ultimately, I just found this very tedious to read. I'm like, Ugh. Even though it's very important. It's so important and it's so true. But I, I just didn't enjoy it. And I rate mostly based on enjoyment. So two stars. It does have an excellent reading of Villette in here by Charlotte Bronte, though, which was one of the only books by a woman that she looked at, which I thought was kind of interesting. I wish she had been discussing a little bit more of some women's literature, but I do understand why she's showing how this degradation that's pushed by men to degrade women is all through our culture. So of course she's gonna be focusing more on the literature that does that, but I would have liked to see some more of women's responses to it. Next up was also for my phone a theory list. This is Sister Outsider by Audre Lorde. So this is a collection of essays that Lorde wrote um, throughout, I think the 70s and 80s is my understanding. And I really enjoyed these. I thought they were great. They're mostly focused on being a black woman or a black lesbian in America, um, particularly being a feminist and the need for kind of intersectionality in our feminism and not just focusing on white women. There's uh, several places in here where she actually calls out other women other feminists. Um, I can't, there was like a, a letter to Mary Daly, I think. I don't remember. I thought that was good. Yeah, a letter to Mary Daly, um, who had completely left black women out of her book, um, Gynecology, which was published in 79, I think. But yeah, so that was really interesting. There's a great interview between her and Adrian Rich in here. There's um, the, ma the essay, The Master's Tools Will Never Dismantle the Master's House, which is fantastic. And I actually am reworking a paper on Uncle Tom's Cabin and the Gothic narrative. And I realized that this essay will work really well in there. And then, yeah, just several other great ones. I really enjoyed those. Four stars. And then the last one was for the nonfiction part of my women's popular fiction list, and it doesn't have a cover. This is Married, Mil Married Mil Middlebrough and Militant, Sarah Gran and the New Woman Novel by Teresa Mangum. And I gave this four stars. So it gives bi biographical information on Sarah Gran, but it's really a critical study of her novels. And it, it was great. I loved this. I, there were a few parts that got slow, especially toward the end, talking about her later fiction, which um, did a lot with eugenics, which I was just like, Ugh. but um, there was great discussion of her early works and then of her three main novels, Idyllia, The Heavenly Twins, and The Beth Book, which I am probably going to be using at least The Beth Book and Heavenly Twins in my dissertation, if not also Idyllia, because it's kind of a trilogy. But yeah, I thought this was great. It gave me some great ideas for things to work with in my exams and in my dissertation. And it gave me more context for Sarah Graham. And it kind of made me like the Heavenly Twins a bit more, which I did like mostly, I, but I gave it three stars, but I had some problems with parts of it, but it made me appreciate it a lot more. All right, so those are the books that I read in September. Let me know down in the comments below. Have you read any of these? What did you think? What did you read in September? It has been great chatting with you. I will see you soon. Bye.